Well, I'm glad to be here, and uh, it's a little bit awkward for me not having back and forth throughout a presentation. They're conscious of the video and wanting to capture like a succinct presentation. So interesting topic. Um, I use ESP as an acronym for Elementary Spiritual Powers, and we all have them. And uh, my hope tonight is that among the plethora of material I've got prepared, some of which I'll actually reference, that you'll take away one thing, that there is something we can do. I mean, the world we live in, if anything, is really conducive to feeling disempowered. What can we do? So I'd like to uh, feel that we can all make a connection with something that we're familiar with that we haven't activated as much as we can, our elementary spiritual powers. How many of you remember the song, Buffalo Springfield, with the odd title for what it's worth? Something's happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Well, that was like in the late 60s, early 70s, somewhere back then. And you could write and sing that song today, and it would be at least as applicable as it was back then. So everything seems to be falling apart. We're more polarized than ever. We face existential threats. What's next, personally and globally? I was reading a quote from a German philosopher who and said this eons ago. The purpose of lying, you know, when it's done by people in power positions, isn't really to get people to believe the lie. It's to get them confused so they don't know what to believe. Because people are easier to control when they're confused. So we live in a world of confusion where you read this on one news source and you read that on another and they're totally conflicting. And then you talk to somebody who was there and it's a third story. So what do you believe? And these days with deep fakes, you can't even believe what you see and hear. I got a phone call today. I don't usually take calls that don't register with a name on my phone, but I took it. And the moment I heard from this guy, there was that characteristic pause. You know, the, you could tell they're kind of in a cubicle somewhere. And oh, I got one, a live one. <laughs> he picked up. And he asked me a question which really didn't make sense, but I was supposed to say yes. And I remembered reading that when you get a call like that, never say yes. Because for some reason, yes is what they capture to deep fake your voice. So I said, no, please take me off your list and hung up. So, so what should we do? What can we do? And what will we do, both personally and globally? The three are pretty different. What should we do is like a sense of duty. I really should do that. Like I should work out at the gym, but I don't want to. What can we do? What's physically possible? I can't fly yet. And what will we do? And that's the one that I'm really interested in, is following through. It's easy to say things. It's easy to believe things. It's easy to get inspired. Uh, I'm as into peak experience as anybody else. But what's it like two weeks later? I've really learned that it's the follow through that counts. So I hope tonight that. Talking about spiritual activism will give you some really practical things to do that you can use to improve your life and your service to others and, as we'll discover later in the presentation, the entire world. You've heard Einstein's famous quote, doing the same thing, expecting a different result, insanity. So, to reach a different destination, we have to change direction, obviously. But we also need to know where we are. If we're using GPS, the first thing you need to do is put in where your location is. It's automatic. But if the system doesn't recognize where you are, how can it direct you to where you want to go? And I think this, as simple as it sounds, is actually very profound. Because there's quite a refusal to acknowledge where we are. Personally, you know, for instance, like, uh, I need to lose 10 pounds, or uh, I've got a credit card that's under control. You know, to just acknowledge something, or I'm addicted to doom scrolling. But until we're willing to confront where we are, we can't really 
head off in a new direction to where we want to go. So what's happening? What's meant to happen? What are the forces resisting what's happening? And how can we best do something about that and contribute? My favorite two words probably in the English language, what if? I'd like to just leave them hanging in the air for a minute. <laughs> what if? I just invite you to not answer the question. <laughs> there is something about not rushing to answers. You know, we're a culture that loves the quick answer. You know, politicians get elected on the basis of promising simple solutions to very complex problems. So we like answers, but what about questions? I think Socrates won every debate simply by asking questions. Isn't that the Socratic method? So what if? And what stirs in you when you contemplate that? Because when we really ask that question and just hang out there, we can connect with our limitations. Like what if? And up comes things that are not possible. Like what if something creative happened in the November election? Oh my god. <laughs> There's a seeming impossibility. I don't think I want to lead with that one, though, because that does seem really, really challenging. <laughs> what if? Can you resonate with that? Yeah. I have felt that way since the moment of my birth. I was born in Calgary, Alberta. And I can remember asking my mother when I was very young, I said, where did I come from? And she said, what do you mean? You were born in the Calgary General Hospital. I said, but I mean, where did I really come from? And if I can remember right, and I think probably I just made this up, but she said, eat your mashed potatoes. <laughs> but I had that feeling, like that there was something other than what I was experiencing in school and with my playground friends, just a stirring of something that I couldn't describe, I couldn't understand, and adults couldn't tell me what it was. So here's a possibility. What if humanity itself is transforming? What if what we're all experiencing proves the principle breakdown before breakthrough? Our transformation, if we are, I experience happening in four stages. And I didn't make this up. This is very, uh, I think Scott Peck has a certain version of it. He wrote The People of the Lie and the Road Less Traveled. People who are asleep, and we've all been asleep, and we're all still asleep in certain areas, we don't know what's going on, and we don't know that we don't know. So it's just kind of a state of flat ignorance. Stage two is we're awakening. We still don't know what's going on, but now we know that we don't know. That's where I was as a child. Hey, there's something going on. What it is ain't exactly clear. Third stage is we start getting out of bed. We're arising. We know something, but we don't know what we know. And this is where teachers are so useful. The best teachers remind us of what we already know. They, they, they don't tell us a bunch of stuff. They may that we don't know, but they really remind us. You know the feeling. You're with someone who's wise, and they're saying things. You're going, yeah, yeah, I, I know that. I know that. But until they said something, it didn't rise to a conscious level. It was just unconscious. That's their value. And then the last, uh, the last stage, being activated, which is what we all are in certain areas of our lives, and I hope when we leave tonight we'll be more activated, is when we know and we know that we know. And that's the teacher. That's the one who's in service, bodhisattva, whatever we call ourselves, when we are in service to help others get to that, that state. And by the way, that state, in my experience, both with myself and the teachers that I really have benefited from, is the state of the perpetual student. So it's ironic. It's a paradox. Because we know and we know that we know. But like, uh, was it Socrates again who said, the one thing I know is that I know nothing. We're in a state of constant um, arising to something new. And that's, uh, that's that state of knowing, paradoxically. So the key is moving from two to three, getting out of bed, and then continuing into four to do something that works. In awakening, 
we realize there's a lot more to life than we thought. That's great, but we can get stuck anywhere along the way. And there's a lot of us who get stuck here. I was for many, many years. A term for this is a spiritual bypass. Heard that term. By the way, when that term is used, and I confess I've used it this way a lot, it's usually negative. But you know, there's a value in bypasses. Like, if you want to make good time, you take the bypass. But if you want to get into things in town, you go into town. So I don't want to be totally negative about the spiritual bypass. However, we do miss a lot when we're on the bypass. And that's characterized by blind faith in what's been discovered, loyalty to a new ideology or a leader, obeying, being compliant, becoming preoccupied with self-improvement, disinterested in the material world. People will say, I don't pay any attention to the news. It just brings me down. I don't want to put my energy on negative things. I don't want to grow what's negative. It's like a garden. You don't pay attention to the weeds. Well, actually, you do. You pull them out. And if there's a leak in your roof, you fix the leak. So we do need to pay attention to everything. But there is a way to, as is put in the Bible, see with our eyes only and not our hearts. We don't get emotionally involved, but we're aware of what's happening. It's good to know what's going on. Whoops. Number three is where skepticism sets in. It's difficult for some people to move from two to three because we give up certainty. Oh, I really believed. Like I was in a, a spiritual community for 21 years. It was fantastic. I, I still have friends that I've known now for 40 years. And there was so much good that happened, but it was also a little cultic. And so I picked up some bad habits and I picked up some programming. And when I started to move out of stage two to stage three, it was really rough to give up the stuff that I believed in. It was like, oh my God, I've not only been believing this, I've been teaching this for 20 years. And it felt like I was being disloyal. And, and it, 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 there was a temptation to invalidate what my experience had been. My experience had been fine. I was growing up. I was just needing to move on. So moving into stage three, we get skeptical. We say, well, really? You're saying that you're channeling this entity who's been dead for 5,000 years. OK. Let me check that out just to make sure that that's actually true. I remember a cartoon I saw once in the New Age Journal said, just because they're dead doesn't mean they're smart. <laughs> <laughs> so it's tough, this phase. We learn about deception. And often leaders who present themselves one way, for instance, they're celibate, and you find out they're having sex with all their followers. That's a shock. And uh, we can lose interest in helping each other get depressed, give up, and get paralyzed into inaction. I know when I left my community, and it was a good one, a lot of really good people there, but that's when I went to Maui and, and met Tashina. I read a book called The Guru Papers, which had just been written, published by a couple, and it was four people leaving cults. And that book saved my life. I read that book, and I wept for a year. I went camping. I had a beautiful dog, a Doberman Pinscher, as my buddy. And I just went through that book over and over again and saw how I had settled into stage two. And I really felt I would never leave there. Of course, I didn't know that's where I was. I thought I'd arrived. So there's kind of a false enlightenment that happens at that level. And I had an experience just recently where I was asked to give an address to a spiritual group. And I was talking about this kind of thing. And most of the people there really enjoyed it, but some of them really did not like it at all. And I was censured because I dared suggest that we get off the spiritual bypass and explore and get skeptical and ask questions, not just be compliant. So there's a challenge to that. Andrew Harvey is a good friend. We had him here a couple of times. He's the Rumi scholar, among other things. And I remember asking him, uh, how do you get activated in terms of bringing your spiritual beliefs into the world in a practical way? And that's what he said. You ask yourself, what breaks my heart? What breaks my heart? And then what am I going to do about it? So the traps here are you can become overzealous, you know, like a person who quits drinking. Everybody they know needs to quit drinking. And they forget that it took them five years to get to that point, right? 
So that's the problem. Diving too deeply into what's wrong with the world, feeling overwhelmed and powerless, deciding it's too late, checking out. Andrew mentioned a friend of his, a good friend who'd been an activist in Africa for many years with a native tribe and 20 years or something. And uh, he got a letter from her saying, by the time you get this letter, I'll be dead. I just can't take it anymore. And she ended her life. She got so overwhelmed with the, the cruelty that, uh, that was happening with those natives. She just, and this is really worth paying attention to. We need each other. <laughs> we need each other. We don't know what's going on behind that smile. There could be a lot of heartache. What breaks your heart? My heart? My heartbreak is around deceit in high places. And this is not limited to this lifetime. I am sure of it. I have a cellular memory, if you could call it that, of being part of the ruling patriarchy. And I have all kinds of ways to validate it. Things have come so easy to me. I've always been in positions of, like up on stage. I started when I was 11, singing country and western music on TV in Calgary. I was an MC for shows like Grand Old Opry's for like 2,000 people at age 11. Who does that? And then throughout my life, always kind of getting to the top without having any ambition. I don't really want that or need it, but I have memories of having been in power positions and been an asshole. And it takes something to admit that you've been a jerk by whatever name. And I know that that was true for me and still is at times. Who isn't? But the memory of that has haunted me. And I, I can remember when I was growing up, my dad used to just rant and rave about all the evildoers in the world. And it always really hurt me. And I didn't know why. And he never did anything about it. He couldn't. But what I try and do about it is it starts with my own life. And then any time I'm in any kind of a leadership position, tiny as it might be, to try and model something rather than teach. Just be it myself. And I'll tell you, doing that, looking in the mirror all the time, surefire recipe for humility. That just never ends. OK, so now some good news. <laughs> Frustration can become anticipation when we learn what's really going on. This is a little sticky. Frustrated about that? Oh, I've got to do it over here. There we go. So what's happened in recent years, and it's been decades, is we've been programmed to consume. It's good for business. So we're all creators, but now we live in a consumer culture where everything's monetized. And how many people do we know who like have a day job, but they really wish they were doing something else? I've been fortunate where all my life I've been able to do what I wanted to do and gotten paid for it. I'm a writer. I've written over 20 books. I would write if I never got paid, and often I'm not. I'll just help a friend, and I love writing. So I've been very fortunate. But I know a lot of people who work at jobs they don't like doing, they have to pay the bills, and they wish they could be doing something else. So where we are now is we're consuming the world's resources, the same way caterpillars eat everything in sight. And this is probably the, the most important concept tonight, is the context that we live in. And I have no way of proving this is true, but I believe it is, that we humans are very much like caterpillars. And we consume, and we consume. But at a certain point, the caterpillar begins to change and turns into a butterfly. Now, for those who don't know that and aren't experiencing any kind of transition, it looks like the end of the world. Like we're running out of resources, the world's in chaos. So my belief is that the goal of those who are in charge, those we know and those we don't know, is to find a way to sustain caterpillar culture forever, the consumer culture forever, somehow. And a, a central part of that is population reduction. I'm reading a really interesting book right now on the Rockefellers, and it's a real eye-opener of how long that family have been at it and the tentacles that wrap around the entire world and the two main themes in their work, which goes through many foundations and organizations, is uh, population control and climate change. And most of the uh, 
climate change organizations, they've been rooted in that family. It's very ironic since they, you know, standard oil, petroleum, but they've been on both sides of the issue. It's very interesting to read. There's a lot more going on there than, than we think. Caterpillars become butterflies. So what are we destined to become? Angels. <laughs> what if? Uh, all of us have touched moments. Like when I was in Maui at age 42, swimming in the caves of Wainapanapa, and I heard a voice say, this is not the place. I'm like, what? Am I in the movie Field of Dreams? Because that's what it sounded like. And then five or so more times during my holiday on Maui, I heard that voice, this is not the place. Last day I was there, I went to the Iao Valley, and the voice said, this is the place. And I asked my former partner to wait for me by the river, and I just climbed this virtually a cliff, hauled myself up by the vines, got to the top, stumbling through the thick underbrush, burst out onto a plateau. There's a rock. I go up in the rock. My arms go up in the air, and I'm in my dream. It's exactly what was happening when I was a child. And this voice said, this is the place. And I go there now when we're on Maui every week. And I go up to that place, I sit there, and I feel into the dream again. But that was a sense of this, a sense of becoming something magical. Like, that's not just ordinary human stuff. You know, and I don't have other experiences like that. That was touching into something. And I want more of that. So, like caterpillars, we're beginning to transform. Don't you feel that? Like personally, that something's changing? You don't feel quite the way you felt like a year ago? Caterpillars begin their transformation. Imaginal cells appear. They go into a cocoon. Well, look what's happening to people and to society. Now, this is where I don't want to sound cynical, but I want to be realistic. Age of Aquarius, remember the song and all that? To me, it was like, well, we'll skip over that middle stage. You know, like I'm a caterpillar on Monday, and on the weekend I'll go to a Tony Robbins seminar, and then on Tuesday the next week I'll be flying, I'll be a butterfly. I think we're heading into the goo. I think we're heading into the cocoon. I don't think we're coming out of it. And I think the world news bears that out, that there's a lot of stuff going on that suggests we're kind of into our dark night of the soul. Now, that doesn't mean we're not beginning to experience the shift. The imaginal cells in the caterpillar show up as it begins to dissolve into the goo. So I think probably all of us are imaginal cells because we have a sense of something. But we're a long ways away from flying yet. Who knows? But you know, we've got a little ways to go in this process. So interesting. And the caterpillar comes out of the cocoon. And if you help it, 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 it dies. It, it, it dies. It can't fly because the struggle of getting out of the cocoon is what strengthens the wings so it can get out and fly. So right now, that's what I'm doing. Are you doing that? Like, I can't say that my life is better than it's ever been. In some levels it is, but there's struggle. There's challenges. And whereas when I was in stage two, I went, oh, well, I've got to meditate more. There's something wrong with me. Now I go, oh, right. I'm coming out of the cocoon. Good. Keep on exercising those muscles. I tried to find some good pictures. <laughs> I don't know what pictures I'd find for what's coming. None of us know. OK, so here we're going to take a little bit of a turn. And I, I'm going to caveat. I am not anti-technology. I'm not a Luddite. I use a computer. I think AI is amazing. However, I stop short of wanting to become a cyborg. Uh, call me old-fashioned, but I don't want to be part of the Borg. So some people do. Ray Kurzweil uh, wrote The Singularity. And uh, he was asked, do you believe there's a god? He said, not yet. Now, to me, that says a lot. And what I see is a kind of a war between those who, and I'm not talking about religion, but those who honor some kind of universal intelligence that's running everything, 
versus those who want to control it all. Smart cities, digital IDs, all this stuff. What's the point? Controlling everything. Now, I'm not really into that because, like, I'll be using my phone and suddenly it doesn't work. And I don't know why. And then the next minute it does work. I kind of am nervous about that if I'm in an airport trying to get on a plane and suddenly I can't get on the plane or if I'm trying to pay somebody and my bank account doesn't work or my car won't start. So I'm not a big fan of automating everything. I kind of like organic stuff. So it's called transhumanism, and the idea is to replace God um, with AI. Natural intelligence with artificial intelligence. I'm always just stunned when I hear someone say they don't believe in God. I, I get it if it's a religious comment. But, and God is a tough word. I, I actually use it as an acronym, gratitude over desire. I love acronyms. I chose that because we demonize desire. But there's nothing wrong with desire. Who doesn't like a good meal or, or lovemaking or a sunset? There's so many things to, to enjoy, but gratitude should be bigger than any of that desire. So you could say the love of God, the love of life, is bigger than the love of anything. And then it's fine, no problem. So I'm not sure how anybody can discount the reality of trillions and trillions and trillions of life functions all happening at the same time seamlessly. Like, is that really just a Newtonian clock that's just ticking along? So who made the clock? You know, it's very interesting. So we're a threat to the new world order, and that's not a new term. It's just called the new world, or actually it's called world order uh, four decades ago. And the idea is eternal life that you can download yourself into hardware and live forever. Yeah, thank you. You know, I'm not, uh, I have no kind of death wish. Um, I'll leave when I leave. I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, there's going to be some kind of deliverance to another world. And I happen to believe that how we die is very important. We won't have time to get into that. That's a whole other thing, but I'll just mention this. Uh, Tashina and I did some work with Tony Robbins many years ago, and he did big workshops on the, on the Big Island in Hawaii. And one of the things we did, besides fire walking, which was a trip, is to go, go up a 40-foot pole, a telephone pole. And that last step was really trippy because you had nothing to hold on to. So you're standing there, and it's you know, moving in the breeze. And you're looking at the ocean 40 feet high. You're on a harness. And then the idea is to jump and catch this, this rope, this cable. And I'd never done it before. So I got up there, and I jumped, and I missed. Because the minute, and the harness caught me and lowered me to the ground, the minute I left the pole, my weight dropped me, and I missed the cable. If I'd had a chance to do it again, which I didn't, I would have aimed much higher and fallen down into the cable. So I've thought of that relative to dying. We want to be as unburdened as possible, take as little as possible with us so we can fly. And that means settling affairs with people. I just wrote a letter to my two brothers. And in the letter, we, we email and phone and so forth. But I wanted to say some things to each of them, which I did. I wrote a letter to my brother-in-law, who's dying. And I just got a text from his wife saying, oh my god, Bob loved your letter, really moved him, and he wants to respond. I figure I've got quite a while to go yet, but uh, my dad had a habit of always being ready for things way ahead of time, and I think I inherited that from him. So I kind of got my bags half packed. So it's important how we leave. And unfinished business, the grudge we hold against someone, uh, you know, let's clean it up. Let's unburden ourselves so we're ready for a good flight. We could spend the whole night on this. <laughs> so we're under surveillance. <laughs> they can tell right now this is being recorded, I'm sure, not just, by, uh, not just in here by Missy. Uh, we've got phones in the room probably. They're picking everything up. You notice how when you have a conversation, then shortly afterwards you start getting ads for the things you were talking about? Like, how does that happen? So my, my idea is that the, the conversation goes both ways. So they're surveilling me. Well, I'm surveilling them. 
and they're harvesting all my data. What am I doing for them? I'm blasting them with love. That's what I'm doing. And we're going to get into that. So we need to help each other. I don't really like the word weapon, but it's kind of cool. It's our sacred weapon, not secret weapon. And we don't use it to fight. So I've felt that there are three practices that we use with spiritual activism to make a difference, working from the inside out. The first one is meditation. Somewhere way back along the way, somebody meditated for the first time, and they called it that. And now it's mainstream. Millions and millions of people meditate. That's an internal process, entirely internal. Mindfulness is an awareness of our immediate surroundings, sensory connection with where we are, particularly in nature. I am inventing a third practice, which I would really love to see go viral, uh, call, that I'm calling activation. And activation is different because it gets into quantum stuff. Einstein called this spooky action at a distance. You've probably heard the term quantum entanglement. It really means being conscious of how we affect each other. And we're going to do an exercise in a moment just to have an experience of this. So there's three steps. And I'm leaning on Timothy Leary's uh, 1967 injunction at the, the festival. Turn on, tune in, drop out. OK, well, I was 17 when he said that. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. So I did. I dropped out. I was um, watching TV in college when Kent State happened. That broke my heart, seeing dead college students. So I left. I checked out. I got on a ship, went to Australia, thought I'd never come back. Then I got the travel bug and kept on going around the world for a year. But I dropped out. No interest in the world, no interest in civic stuff, nothing. I just meditated. I got into a spiritual group, made enough money to get by, but never had any ambition. I had a wound that was really keeping me out of the world. So I'm changing this to turn on, which is connect with the intelligence of life. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm not plugged in. I don't, there's no wire, and I don't have a battery, but something is keeping my heart beating. So turning on is really just acknowledging that we're already turned on. We're already connected to life. Tune in is connecting with each other. We're already connected, but how do we treat each other? And engaging is connecting with the world and contributing. Turn on, being grateful for the gift of life. Tune in, appreciating others and engaging, giving our gifts to the world. So let's do the first one here. It's very simple. Appreciating that life is free, it's a gift, we could express our gratitude and do that simply by saying thank you. I, I have an audio program I made with some music and my voice, and the first step is saying thank you. So I'd love us all just to do that right now and just feel it. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And feel like a fountain of gratitude inside. Thank you. Because we can't give what we don't have. I have a friend in Jerusalem who does energy healings there. and He's a wonderful man living right in the heart of that conflict. And a couple of years ago, he invited me to do a presentation, be in his circle by Zoom. And I did that. But he did a little process, and he started with you know, giving love to people. And I said, Jeffrey, we can't give what we don't have. We should start with receiving, acknowledging what we've got, and then letting it overflow and share with other people. So that's how simple that is. Thank you. Being grateful. A person who is grateful, I mean genuinely grateful, is going to be kind of a nice person. Like you don't find a grateful robber. Well, you might say, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate getting your wallet. <laughs> so tuning in is connecting with each other. I do this um, every morning, every evening in my meditation. I say to myself, I care about. And then I let someone swim into my mind. And quite often, it's people I saw the day before. I'll think of my mother, who's been gone for 15 years. 
I'll think of a, someone on the news I just saw, but I'll go, I care about Charles, my brother. And I'll just think of him, and I'll feel our connection. And I'll go, I care about Lisa. Did that this morning, because you guys were just visiting. I care about Shady. Uh, and as I say the name, I imagine the person, I picture them, and I feel the connection between us. And because I've been doing this for a long time, I'm starting to notice the nature of the connection. It isn't just, oh, they're shady. It's like, oh, am I feeling a little tinge of, what is that? Sadness? Oh, hi, shady. And then, you know, there's Wendell. So let's say I think of Wendell, and I think, oh, he's so enthusiastic, <laughs> you know? And so I'm with Wendell for five seconds, and I feel like a little kid. So in other words, this exercise sharpens our ESP, our ability to discern what the nature of the connection is with people. We've all had the experience. You think of someone on the phone rings. It's them. What's that? See, this is, we already have this. It's about developing it. So let's do this right now. Let's just say silently or loud, whatever, I care about and think of someone. I care about. Okay, and I care about, think of someone else. I care about and someone else. We begin to experience ourselves beyond our bodies, beyond this identity as a single human, experiencing ourselves as part of the human community. Just like the mycelium network in the forest, we're all connected. We're always communicating with each other. Engage. So there's four steps to this one. So the first one is I belong. It's a feeling that so many people do not have. I never felt I belonged in school. And, you know, fortunately, I was really good at hockey, so I had something I could do. So I wasn't quite as weird as I would have been without that. But I never really felt I belonged. So at this step, to engage, it's about nature. And imagine right now some favorite place in nature. Easy for me, because we live in such a beautiful paradise out on old Highway 99. So I often think of the pond where I swim every morning regardless of temperature. And I'll think of the pond and just imagine being there. So th pick a spot in nature and just imagine you're there, activate your senses. What do you see? What do you hear? And just say silent to you, silently to yourself, I belong here. I belong here. I belong here. So many people have so little experience of nature. Kids have never seen the stars and think food comes from the grocery store. But nature is our home. And there's a great book I'll recommend, Mirrors in the Earth by Asia Suler. It's a phenomenal book, this young woman's journey in nature and her awakening. And she says things in there, like every page, I could be pulling out quotes. But one thing she said that I remember was her first experience of being in nature where she heard birds singing and realized they were singing to her. And that was a novel idea to her. And it was to me. And now when I do my walk from our home across the creek up to the pond in the early morning to swim, there's usually birds. This morning, there was a gigantic blue heron that followed me. He flew right beside me up to the pond and then perched there while I was swimming. Well, he was there to hang with me. He just wanted to hang with me, like, who's this weirdo? And uh, so nature is where we belong, even in a building like this. We belong in the web of life. Second one is I feel. I put a little circle around it. I have so much fun doing this. You know, when you're a writer for a living, you really love doing graphics. <laughs> it's like so different. So I feel. Now, here's an interesting thing. This will sound odd, me being a writer. I've been experimenting with experiencing things beyond words. Like originally when I was doing this exercise, I was like, 
I feel, and then I go happy, sad, excited, nervous, whatever, just checking in with how I felt. Now I'm doing it without adding words to see if I can just feel what I'm feeling. So I'd invite you to try that. And I had trouble doing this because I'm a wordsmith. But to not put words to it, just to say, like right now, I feel. And tune in to what you're feeling. I feel. It's a healing practice, I'll tell you, because there's no judgment. Like it's not, well, I wish I wasn't feeling this way. It's just I feel. And then number three, I am. This is really profound. I am. What am I? A writer? A speaker? A husband? A son? Well, again, not adding words, just I am. It kind of gets to that um, biblical promise, I am that I am. It's just I am that I am. I am. Just a state of being. I am. So try that one out. Just silently say to yourself, I am, and then resist putting any label on it at all. I am. OK. And then the last one in this uh, little series is I will. And this is a very different energy because we're focusing something moving out. I will mow the lawn. I will have lunch with my friend tomorrow. I will. It's doing something in the world. The point of this exercise is to begin to be familiar with the energy inside us. Um, I had an energy healing center up in Canada, in Victoria, for six years. I wrote a book about it, traveled around training practitioners. And I was basically for six years, five and a half years, in an office in Victoria, seeing clients, using my hands, and just detecting what was going on in their bodies without touching them. It's like Reiki. So I became very attuned, uh, and I could tell quite a bit. And it must have worked, because people kept coming. Uh, I still do this a little bit, but the other day, uh, I have some carpal tunnel stuff because of typing so much. It's starting to get better because I'm icing my wrists and everything every day. But I had a little nervous thing develop, a little tingling moving down from here to here on this left arm. Not good. Left side, right? So I was concerned about it, but I've checked it out, and it seems to be a minor thing. But I, I asked myself, well, what is that? Where is that coming from? So I did a little searching around in my body, a little scanning. Like, you can do this, right? Everybody can do that? How do we do that? We direct ourselves to do that. Can you wiggle your ears? I can't. But a lot of people, some people can. And there's a guy with a YouTube video teaching you how to wiggle your ears. Like in three minutes, you can learn how to wiggle your ears. You do something with your jaw. and you. Anyway, we can develop muscles that we don't know how to use right now. So I scanned my body, and I found that there's a point right up here. It's that bone, whatever it's called, right there that seems to be the vortex where the energy is clogged or something. So I'm now able, when that flares up, to just concentrate my attention, find that spot, and just be there. I'm not trying to do anything, but I just hold my attention there. And within about 10 seconds, all the sensations go away. And I've experimented, like got in the middle of it, and then take my attention away, and it comes right back. <laughs> so I know it's working. And I'm mentioning it because. The point of doing this kind of thing is learning what is a different feeling, the different sensation between identifying how we feel, connecting with who we are, and then focusing energy moving out from ourselves. ESP, elementary spiritual powers. So there's the whole formula. Just maybe follow me silently. Thank you. I care about, I belong, I feel, I am, I will. So I have a five minute audio that I made with this in there. If anybody wants it, I can just email it to you. It's got some music and I've been doing it every morning uh, for about four months. And I notice a real change in my ability to detect the different kinds of energy. 
All right. So, as spiritual activists wielding the sacred weapon of love, we transmit a consistently high frequency that nourishes our fellow imaginal selves and uplifts any individuals who are open to arise, shifting from two to three, and then activate. This includes loving the bad guys. So now we're going to have some fun. Because yeah. <laughs> what do you do about the evildoers? My dad just ranted and raved, and a lot of us feel powerless. And my friend Foster Gamble, you know, who made the whole Thrive movement, he's so well educated in the cabal behind the scenes. And, but what do you do about these guys? They have the money, the power, the media, etc. So we're going to learn what we can do about it. So we're going to shine light into darkness. Here's one example. Back in March 2022, Ukraine was just starting. Tulsi Gabbard revealed that the US operates bioweapons research labs in the Ukraine. Do you know who Tulsi Gabbard is? Mm -hmm. Immediately, John Kerry disputed her claim, called her a traitor to her country, and the mainstream media just chimed in and just, this is a Russian conspiracy theory. Uh, Victoria Nuland, some of you may know her, Under Secretary of State, hmm. being questioned in Congress under oath admitted that actually they do have 46 labs operating in the Ukraine. Nobody has issued an apology for lying. <laughs> hmm. This has now become normal. What used to be just conspiracy theories are now mostly trailers for upcoming events. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the tinfoil hat guys often prove to be right. Here's another one. Okay. 2020, Michigan Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer, there was a terrorist plot to kill her, front page headlines. This guy um, was learned he had joined the militia, became an FBI informant. And what they really discovered, uh, this guy talks about it online, is that a number of FBI agents had infiltrated the plot, and it was really entrapment. They had actually stimulated the plot. They would orchestrated it. And this is done a lot. Yeah. I was reading that um, the Stasi did this in Germany. Uh -huh. uh, they would get an infiltrator into a group, and he would say, let's kill him. Let's, let's get violent. And it, they'd all go, well, no, we don't do that. But then they would come in and say, well, that's what that group was advocating because of that guy. And he was a plant. Mm -hmm. So again, this is being kind of normal now. Here's the last one, thankfully. Back in 2020, the whole start of the pandemic, uh, lab leak theory is BS. Of course, the email trail has come out now, revealing that they want to make sure it seemed to be BS. And then Trump, Operation Warp Speed, will get the vaccine done. As, as quickly as possible. And then uh, going back to the Nuremberg Code, which people seem to have forgotten, it's fairly long. Number one, the number one point is the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential when you're administering some kind of medicine. Hmm. So what about lap dances for getting vaccinated? Mm -hmm. What about all the coercion and the refusal to even say what was in them? So. This is not normal. <laughs> we, we should be able to trust authorities, not find out later that they were lying to us just to confuse us and control us. Again, though, what do we do about it? Do we just rant and rave, or can we do something constructive? Again, what can we, what should we, what will we do? Just rail against them, ignore it, move somewhere else? If we wait for these guys to change, we're going to wait a long time. So I don't advocate that. I also don't advocate burying our heads in the sand and ignoring it. But there's something else we can do. Whoops. We can get activated as spiritual activists. We can extend an influence through the quantum field that's been proven to work. This is not theory or woo-woo new age stuff. The Maharishi effect back in, when was that? Uh, 83, I think, uh, in DC. 700 uh, advanced city meditators meditated for a couple of months and lowered the crime rate by 23.3%. The chief of police, when he heard about this, said the only thing that could do that would be a snowstorm in summer to lower the crime rate. But he had to admit later that it had worked. Now, that should have been front page headlines. 
Don't you think? That should have been, wow, how did that happen? Let's find out what happened, see if we can duplicate it, double blind studies, you name it, because there was internal work influencing the material world in a good way. Wouldn't that have been something we should have learned how to do? I would have thought so, but it was kind of buried. So leaders wanted, are you willing to take a stand for love, to inform yourself of what's going on, remain above the conflict, shine light into darkness, and contribute to deep healing via a quantum transmission? That's a pretty bold invitation. So here's something that Jefferson said, and he was 33 when he said it. Are you okay with me reading it, or do you just? Yeah. Yeah. Give up money, give up fame, give up science, give up the earth itself and all it contains, rather than do an immoral act. And never suppose in any possible situation or under any circumstance, it's best for you to do a dishonorable thing. Though it can be known only but to yourself, ask yourself, how would you act were all the world looking at you and act accordingly? In other words, always do the right thing. <laughs> what if everybody always did the right thing? You used to imagine that. You know, I tell this story about finding a wallet in a parking lot in Maui, and it was a parking lot that served about 20 stores. So there was a name in there, but there was no phone number, and I didn't know how to get in touch with this person. So I got to my car, and I sat there. I thought, well, what am I going to do? Well, there's a couple of credit cards in there. So I phoned one of them, and I got an agent, and I explained what was going on. And uh, he said, well, I have her phone number on file, but I can't give it to you. He said, but I can call her and tell her about this. I said, great, I'm going to leave the, the wallet in this health food store with the manager. Tell her it's in there. And please ask her to text me and confirm that she got it. So an hour or so later, I get a text, this woman. She says, oh my god, I was flying home tomorrow. I couldn't have got on the plane without my ID. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. What's your Venmo uh, send you? What do you I'd love to give you something. And I texted back and I said, well, I'm so glad it worked out. Of course, you don't need to give me anything. Great. And then I'm driving and I'm thinking, you know what? I could ask her for something. I'd noticed she was like 28 working at Google. And uh, so I wrote her back and I said, there is something you can do for me. You're a young woman. You're just starting your career. Do good in the world. <laughs> she texted me back and she said, I will never forget this. And I will. I will do good in the world. Now, that took me 20 minutes of my life. What was I going to do? Keep the wallet, take out the 100 bucks, and throw the card away, cards away or something? It was just the right thing to do. I'm not telling the story to pretend I'm some kind of saint. Everybody in this room would have done the same thing, right? What if everybody was inspired to do the right thing? How would they be? How would they be? There are so many stories, I'm, I'm not going to read, I have some, but I don't want to read them, of near misses. I'll just refer to this one. Got to watch my time. 1962, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, there was a very near miss with uh, uh, a possible nuclear attack. And uh, the submarine's executive officer, Vasily Arkhipov, resisted pressure from the captain and two other senior officers who were all pushing for an attack. And he, he said no, and they, they didn't attack. Another one in 1983, a near, near miss. And there's a bunch of these where somebody in a position of authority broke the rules on a hunch and did the right thing and averted disaster. I believe that those people are influenced by the frequency of mass consciousness. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. And that every one of us is contributing to that. And we don't know if, if maybe Anya's loving gesture towards her neighbor at 5.02 on a Thursday afternoon might not just be the key component that contributes to someone somewhere she will never meet making a different decision. How's that for grandiosity? Reminds me of a joke. <laughs> Stephen Wright, the comedian, 
my favorite comedian, totally droll. He said he moved into an apartment, there was a switch on the wall and he flipped it and nothing happened. So he'd switch it five or six times a day and a couple of months later he got a postcard from some stranger in Belgium saying, cut it out. <laughs> Quantum entanglement. <laughs> Speaking of the founding fathers, let's see this is scaling a little differently. Look at the age. Jefferson was 33, Monroe was 18, Alexander Hamilton was 21. Why do we think of them as old men? They were young guys. They weren't old men. Old men promise the impossible to retain control. Where have we seen that repeated over and over again? It's time for us to get activated, pay attention, and uplift with the frequency of love, etc., etc. And this is something I really want to underline. I'm an elder. What am I doing standing here? I'm okay doing this, but I'd sure rather be sitting there listening to a 30 year old. I mean that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fundamental flaw in our culture that old people, well, people get into positions of power and then they get older and they don't leave and they get old. <coughs> We've just seen that depicted in the political scene. It's embarrassing. So where are the young leaders, like the ones who wrote the Declaration of Independence? So some practical steps. We're getting near the end here, so I want to get some practical steps in. The observer effect, um, you know what that means? It's how we view things changes what we're looking at. So, hi Kelly. So I really feel a key to ESP, to uh, practical magic, to having a, an effect in the world is this, you and me, you and me, the three of us, the 20 of us. Where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Christ said that. What does that mean? If we take it out of a theoretical religious context, it means that there's a different energy. When two people or more resonate with the same frequency, let's say unconditional love, there's an emanation. There's something additional. I think this is the key. Not getting a million people to do something, but close in, one on one, being present with each other, you know, resonating together, having a quantum effect. Here's a good one. Be 100% responsible. You know, it's kind of risky to believe that the slate is wiped clean when we die and that the things we've done that we think are secret will stay secret. <laughs> I don't believe that for a minute. I think everything has consequences. So if we, you, that little exercise we did helps us experience ourselves. I have another one that relates to the heart where we expand out beyond our body. Helps us experience ourselves as something. Buckminster Fuller wrote a book called I Seem to Be a Verb. <laughs> It's a great title. I'm something in action. I'm not a thing. I'm an energy, an immortal energy occupying a mortal body. This is one of my favorites, using money, because you know they say follow the money. When there's deceit, you usually just look, where, where's the money? Who's making money from this? And then you find out what's going on. So I, I want to leave time to talk about that. These are the four. So what breaks your heart? And I'd really like you to think about that as you're driving home tonight and sleeping tonight. If you haven't connected with it yet, maybe it's time to do that. What breaks your heart and what are you doing about it? And then I have some initiatives and there's books here that I've written uh, that cover them. The Noon Club, very simple. You just set your phone for noon every day and when it goes off, you just pause for a moment and pray. Very simple. Love casting is what we were doing. I care about. I love cast every morning, every evening, while I'm sitting waiting for light to change. Instead of just sitting there daydreaming, I send love out to people. Do it all the time. And the Maharishi effect we've already talked about. So let's spend a moment on money since it's such a big, big deal. Being generous with our money. I've never had a lot of money, but I always feel I've been fairly generous with it. Tashina helps me uh, be more generous at times. But the free flow, giving and receiving, and not hanging on and worrying about hoarding it. Uh, gifting exchanges, doing things without needing money, sure I'll help you. 
and not keeping track, just giving each other things. Great fun. Jackpot tipping. My uh, friend Jeff, our neighbor, told me about this one. It's really fun. You decide what your normal tip is going to be, say 20%, and you are always tipping with cash. So you're tipping away, and then one day the service is lousy. So you only tip 10%. You take the difference and you put it in a place in your wallet, and you keep storing money there. <laughs> and over time, you've got a little bit of a, a jackpot building up in there. And then I remember, I haven't done this a lot, but one day I did this. I think I had a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or something, and the bill was like $4. The waiter, waitress, I forget, was fantastic. Like, just made me feel like I was the only customer in the world, and she was great, or he was great. And I thought, oh, this is the time for the jackpot tip. So I pulled it out, and on a $4 bill, it was like a $35 tip. <laughs> she hit the jackpot, but so did I. Because we both felt what it's like to be free and easy with money. Um, the personal lottery is really cool. I haven't done this in a while. I think I'll start again. I used to carry a $50 bill around. And this was years ago when 50 bucks meant something. And I just give it away. I did it maybe three or four times. Just give it to some person because I wanted to. And one occasion up in Vancouver, Canada, I went for a business consult with some old guy who proved to be very depressed and really thought my business idea was terrible. It was 100% negative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm like a 25-year-old, and he's really crushed my dream. Every once in a while, I have an idea, as my friends know. So I had an idea, and he told me it was lousy. He was right. But <laughs> I, I realized that I could give him the $50. <laughs> And so I pulled it out as I was leaving. I said, here, I'd like you to have this. And he was like, <laughs> like I was trying to bribe him. You know, he was a government uh, employee. And I said, well, this, this is legit. I just do this once in a while. It's a game. I play a hobby. Love you to have it. He refused it three or four times. Finally, he took it. Followed me out of his office, into the elevator, down the elevator, outside onto Hastings Street, standing in the rain, telling me about his train set. <laughs> he had a model train set and how he was going to buy a caboose or an engine or something. This old fart, he's probably my age, turned into a, an excited young boy just because I did that with him. Now, I've remembered that. I've told that story a lot. How much value did I get out of that 50 bucks? And what did it do for him? So that's something we can do with money. And then just donate. Like, don't give money to these big organizations where they spend 90% of it on administration. Give it to a friend or give it to me. I've got a foundation. I can use some money. But put it somewhere where it goes to good use, somewhere you know that it's going to go to good use. So what about the bad guys? We can't leave them hanging. Tulsi, thank you. John Kerry, I forgive you. Let's see if we can turn denial into remorse. And Victoria Newland, how about some repentance? She can do better. Now, we don't have time to get into this, but this is the woman, this is the person who nuked the Ukraine peace accord that was signed by Yelensky and Putin. There was no need for any war. A million people have died. She sent Boris Johnson there to shatter that peace accord, and he did, and we have war there. So this is a woman who's deeply disturbed. But as I say that, I don't want to be a hater. I want to look at her and go, you know, there's somewhere in you that's better than that. You can do better. So we could, next time you get into Trump derangement syndrome, you know what that is, right? Yeah. <laughs> Trump's the devil or Trump's the savior. <laughs> Nothing in between, right? So the next time you think of him, just see what you'd like to send him. And hate is not an option. <laughs> and then this one, Gretchen in Michigan, come clean, come clean, tell the truth. And Vivek, thank you for saying what he said on mainstream news. And here, yeah. Fauci, if you've read the book, The Real Anthony Fauci by Kennedy, what a story. And this is a man with a real history, and there's some accounting there. So what do we do? Offer forgiveness. See if a miracle could happen. And how about Trump telling the truth? I have a friend who, is, who worked with Trump a lot, and he said he was in rooms so many times when Trump would just tell lies, flat out, eye to eye, just tell lies. So how about telling the truth? And when we think of the Nuremberg Code, the 22 Nazis who were on trial there and sentenced, how about we learn from history 
and we abide by that accord that took two years to hammer out, and we totally forgot about it during the pandemic. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Remember who said that? <laughs> right? He was sure appreciated, wasn't he? Look what happened to him. So just because we're expressing love doesn't mean that the world's going to give us a whole bunch of wonderful things. You know, but what's our priority? <laughs> I hope it's becoming clear. I don't think he really said that. One of Einstein's best quotes is, I didn't say half the things people say I did. <laughs> but I believe he inferred something like that. If a person doesn't have some belief in a higher power by whatever name, they're vulnerable to being sold anything. They'll believe in this network marketing company, this guru, whatever. We've got to have some orientation in something higher and not get hung up on the descriptions of it. Whatever it is, it doesn't care what we call it. <laughs> Would appreciate being acknowledged, though. What breaks your heart, and what are you going to do about it? That's what I'd like to leave, leave you with. So I see the future. I see a future that works for everyone. I see a world of love and peace, where every individual is inspired to do the right thing, always, no matter what. I see communities of harmony and fun, where everyone feels safe, where every person is fed and housed and employed at work that they love. I see a world of interconnection, a network that includes every species within the community of life that inhabits this planet. I see universal intelligence guiding every human choice, just as it already does for every other life form. I see a future being seeded now and nourished inside the hearts of every activated imaginal cell who is committed to living in service as their highest aspiration and their greatest fulfillment. That's my hope.